And on the line from Washington, D.C., Ivan Semenik, science journalist. We spent the week looking at current developments in NASA and our understanding of the universe. Scientists are attempting to unlock the secrets of dark matter and dark energy. And Ivan is here to tell us why that should matter to all of us. Hi there. Hi there. Ivan, let's begin with uh, sort of looking back over the last decade. How has our understanding of the universe changed? It's a great question because really it has changed a lot. I think uh, people have a sense that maybe telescopes are bigger and better. We have these lovely pictures from the Hubble Space Co Telescope, for example, uh, more probes on other planets. But really the big change is uh, in a domain that we cannot see at all. We can't even show people pictures of, of what astronomers are looking at. And it's this opening up of the universe in the dark domain. Things which do not give off light or phenomena which do not give off light and can only be perceived indirectly. And yet it turns out that these phenomena actually dominate the universe. And, uh, you know, we, it's been four centuries since the telescope was invented. And for most of the history of astronomy as a science, it's been a matter of looking at stars, looking at galaxies, looking at planets, and trying to perceive or, or tease out information by looking at the light of these different distant objects. Now, it turns out that that's just a small fraction of what's out there, and uh, astronomers are, are trying to get a handle of this, uh, this dark domain. Okay, we can't see the dark domain, but we can bring up a pie graph to show how much of our yes. universe it, it does make up. Take a look at this. So right. in this pie graph, uh, dark matter, what's known as dark matter, and we'll talk about what exactly that might be in a minute, but that makes up about 23% of the universe, dark energy, 72%. So the remaining almost 5% is atoms. That's everything else we know of, right? That fits into that 5%. So Right. Everything you can see. Everything we can see. Okay. How did we get to this point of, of being able to understand the content of the universe? How did we get here? That's a great question because it's kind of hard to understand what that means. Like what do we mean by, you know, 23% is, is dark matter? What that's really referring to isn't the volume of space so much as the matter energy budget of space. You know, what, what are the contents of the universe? The, we know that the universe has matter and energy. Uh, and in some sense, these things are equivalent. You know, Einstein came up with that wonderfully simple equation, E equals mc squared, which kind of relates energy and matter. So let's just imagine that, you know, we're going to think of all the energy, all the matter, it's all one big thing. Uh, and it's somehow spread out into this volume of space. You know, we don't know how, if it goes on forever or, or what, but we know that there's this kind of volume of space that we can observe. So what is in that space? Well, in the past, it seemed like there was a little bit of matter because you could see mostly empty space, mostly black space, and then at certain points you see these little dots, stars, and then off in the distance these fuzzy patches which turned out to be distant galaxies made of stars even further away. Uh, and as we look further and further we see more and more galaxies. So that's the part that we think of as matter, the, the, the stuff that lights up the universe and even the gas and the dust, stuff that maybe we can't see easily but we know it's there, it's all part of normal matter, it interacts uh, with matter the way we're used to having matter interact here on Earth. And in fact, the Earth itself is, is part of this stuff. Earth is just a little bit of leftover interstellar material swept up in the formation of the Sun, coalescing to form a planet where we now happen to live. So you know, we're all part of that domain. So it, it, was a, it took a little while to realize that th there's a lot more out there. Um, and uh, dark matter is sort of the first, first step in that process. Uh, astronomers began to realize that objects in space were not moving the way they should if we understood gravity correctly. So, so galaxies were rotating in ways that were n not, not as you would expect. Uh, certain groups of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, were hanging together in ways that were different from what you would expect if you sort of counted up all the matter and, and did the math to see, you know, how should, how should gravity behave in these places. And little by little it was realized that there's a lot more stuff there because there's much more gravity than we realize. And in fact in our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, the stars moving around the center of the Milky Way right out to the edges of the Milky Way are moving as though there, there are many times more matter 
uh, around us than we can see in the stars. So that's how we've come to understand that there is something called dark matter, that there's another form of matter. It doesn't give off light. Uh, it, it, and it also would not interact with ordinary matter. So, so if there was a lump of it, uh, you know, and you tried to hold it in your hands, it would uh, fall through your hands, fall through the floor. Uh, it, it, it doesn't interact with other mat atoms of ordinary matter. It only interacts via gravity. So, so this stuff is out there. No one knows what it is, except that it's <laughs> some kind of particle, some form of matter. Okay. So that's the dark matter part. Okay, I can't see it, I can't feel it, I gotta trust you and, and trust scientists who tell me that this stuff exists. Good, okay. Right. Now there's something even more obscure out there known as dark right. energy. What's that? Yes. Dark energy is sort of the new big discovery, new in the sense of sort of the last 10 years. This is really the, the change that's, that's taken over the field. In the late 1990s, people began to make very detailed measurements of how the universe was expanding. I know this is a little bit tricky to wrap your head around, but we, we know that our universe is not static. It, it started in some kind of a, a high temperature event called the Big Bang, uh, you know, that the universe was once much smaller, all the matter and energy compressed, you know, in a much, much smaller volume, and that something happened to cause the universe to spread out and expand. So, so um, that's all, it, it's, it takes a bit of effort to understand that. It's not that things are flying outward into space, mm. but that space itself is growing. Uh, you know, e every part of space itself is actually growing larger over time. And we can see this because when we look at distant galaxies, we can see that they are moving away from us. There are ways of measuring the velocity at which things are moving in space, and we know that the galaxies are all moving away, and the farther away they are, the faster they're moving. So that's fine. That's something that we've known, you know, almost uh, for 80 years now. But uh, uh, the, the, the catch is that uh, it was always thought that this would be slowing down, that things would be moving apart, but that the gravity of all of that matter, and especially once you add in the dark matter, all of that stuff would gradually be kind of, the gravity would be pulling on it. So like they, they, it would pull on itself and, and try to arrest that outward movement. You can imagine all these things attracting each other with their gravity and kind of holding each other back from expanding too far. And perhaps maybe ultimately the, everything would collapse back in and, and the universe would sort of uh, come back together sort of in reverse of the Big Bang. Well, so astronomers set out to try to see if they could see the slowing down of the expansion of the universe. What they found was utterly shocking. Mm. Uh, I still remember being at the press conference in 1998 when this was announced, and you just imagine a room full of reporters being told something for perhaps half an hour, and then at the end, no one could think of a question to ask <laughs> except... Could you say that all over again? <laughs> it, I mean, really, it just was impossible to understand. But what they found, basically, was that instead of slowing down, the expansion of the universe was speeding up, that, this, that things were moving apart faster and faster, that there was some additional phenomena that was helping to drive the expansion of the universe outward. And this phenomena, whatever it is, has been called now dark energy. And maybe one simple way of understanding it is that in the vacuum of space, even if you took away all the matter, took away all the dark matter, and just had this kind of volume of space with nothing in it, just the vacuum, that the vacuum itself has a kind of energy to it. And that energy, whatever it is, is contributing to this outward expansion. That's one theory, and, and so it's possible that that's what the dark energy is, and there's enough of it to account for sort of the rest of the uh, energy budget of the universe, as it were. Okay, maybe you should have held that press conference. You did a pretty good job explaining it there. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I've, had ten, I've had 12 years to think about it now. <laughs> like, what was it that I heard? So. Let me ask you this. Beyond curiosity of, of why dark matter and dark energy exist, why do we actually need to understand this any better? Well, um, it, it actually relates to a couple of things. I mean, from the curiosity point of view, we also want to understand what we're made of. You know, there's another thread of, of scientific discovery, which is understanding, the, you know, the very small, understanding the particles that make us up. We, we know that our bodies are made of cells, that the cells are made of molecules, that the molecules are made of atoms, that the atoms themselves are made of tiny little pieces, electrons, protons. Inside there are the quarks. And... And, you know, we've broken it down now, or I should say physicists have broken it down to this family of particles that seem to be the fundamental particles. But it's clear 
that these particles don't, under, don't explain everything about the universe. And it's very unsatisfying to say, okay, there's a bunch of different particles and they behave in certain ways, but there doesn't seem to be an ex any explanation for exactly why, why this many, what do they all do? And so there's sort of clearly another theory beyond that. And dark matter is the most obvious manifestation that there's got to be some other theory. Because you've got all these particles that explain matter as we know it, particles that have been seen and created in particle accelerators, for example. But meanwhile, there's this dark matter, which has got to be made of something else. So it, clearly, it's telling us that there's some deeper understanding of the fundamental nature of reality that we're not getting yet. And, and dark matter is like this big signal that's saying, hey, there's something else here that your theories do not explain. So, so it's hope that, you know, one possibility is, you know, there's this giant particle accelerator at, in, near Geneva, uh, the, the Large Hadron Collider, which just came on last year. You know, as this thing ramps up and we see more and more collisions, maybe we'll start to see it manufacturing dark matter, and then we can actually fit that in. There are other experiments deep underground, and in fact, in, in the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, this would be a candidate location for this kind of experiment, where deep below ground, where you can kind of shield off other phenomena, dark matter would still be passing through. Remember how I said it would like pass through your hands? Well, it would also pass right through the rock and maybe through the mines of Sudbury and, and possibly could be detected uh, as it passes through. So, so there are these experiments to try to understand what, what we're made of. The other reason for understanding this, for, be, for caring about this, is that you know, what is the far future of the cosmos? How long, I mean, we, we know that our sun will shine on for five billion years, so you know, we're we're good for a while. We're safe, yeah. But, uh, but, but what about after that? Like, what about after all the stars? And, and what about all the galaxies? Like, how much longer would the universe go on? And knowing about the dark matter and the dark energy totally changes our picture of the future. Okay, no, knowing uh, whether the universe is expanding or contracting, which is what we're trying to figure out through dark matter and uh, dark energy, why does that matter? Why do we need to know whether our universe is expanding or contracting? Well, first of all, it's a great, it's, it makes for great conversations when you're lying <laughs> on the beach late at night watching the shooting stars, right? It's just, you can't beat it. Uh, I really think that it's in our nature to ask these questions. Um, I don't know if we'll ever harness it, but it's worth pointing out that in the past, fundamental physics has, when it, when, when, Researchers have simply tried to ask the question, you know, what is matter? What is reality made of? What are the constituents and the laws that govern reality at its most fundamental level? In the past, when people have just simply gone out and searched for answers to those questions, all kinds of practical applications that we could never have predicted came out of that. You know, some of them are you know, n not so happy, you know, like uh, nuclear weapons. But others would include the laser, for example, incredibly practical device. Uh, you know, even electricity, harnessing electricity, harnessing r uh, radio waves, you know, that comes out of the 19th century version of probing the forces and, and, and the matter to, as, as people understood it at the time. So it could be that asking these questions, we're going to turn up something that may be extremely valuable to our descendants. We don't know for sure. The, the point is, if, if they're, I mean, everyone's always going to ask questions. You know, the ancient philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, these, these guys were asking the same questions. The only difference is now we have some tools where we can maybe even get at some answers. So why not? Why not try and get those answers? You know, we mentioned this earlier in the week. You're a Canadian. And I want to ask you, we're talking about fundamental physics and stuff. RIM co-founder Michael Lazaridis, uh, you know, established the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo to do just that, to support theoretical physics. Is this the kind of approach you think, Ivan, that's needed to unlock eventually uh, the riddle that is the universe? Uh, absolutely. This is, this is exactly the same sort of thinking, that there, that there is an inherent value in, in asking these questions, that in the past it's proven to be very valuable to us to ask the questions, but, I, but yet there's also this underlying uh, sense that one way or another we're bound to try to get these answers. You know, we've, we've always been asking, you know, we as a species, we've always been asking questions about, you know, the nature of, of reality. 
and uh, you know the advent of science has 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 delivered answers that it's just staggering when you stop and think about it. I mean, just imagine the human brain, you know, 20 centimeters across, about this big. It's just this tiny little thing. The human brain seems to be now capable of conceiving of a, of a universe that, you know, is billions of light years across. Somehow in our minds, we're able to travel to these distant places and to take in the scope of everything we can survey. It's astounding to imagine that, you know, these, these creatures that we are on this tiny little planet in the middle of space that, that we've managed to comprehend as much as we have. We don't know how much more we can understand. We don't know what the limits are to scientific understanding. It just seems crazy not to try to keep probing. It can't be everything we do. There are many other problems in the world that need to be solved, but it seems inevitable that some part of our effort would be going towards answering these really deep questions. Ivan, I have to say, I thoroughly enjoy your uh, childlike excitement about the world of science. Thank you very much for a fascinating week of great insights. Thank you so much.